I think you all know Carrie Kasem and her father and the story of what happened to her father. Um, this problem is happening all across our country right now, not just to the rich and the famous, but to everyday people. Um, four years ago, my life changed. I lost my father. He was a humble man. He was a teacher, became a book salesman, and started his own publishing company to teach children how to read. It became very, very successful, and in his 60s, he sold it for a very large amount of money. By that time, all of his children, my siblings, and my special needs brother were grown, had our own families. We were so proud of our father and what he accomplished. So many times he was unable to come to our functions as children because he was busy working to make a living and he would always say, this is for our family. This is for our family. He was marked. After he got his money, he suffered a stroke and several people entered into his life, a finance manager, an estate lawyer, a bookkeeper, a CPA, and lastly, a woman who had worked for him before. He was basically stolen from our family. I did not get to see my father for the last 14 months of his life. I was told that my father did not want to see me. This was devastating to our family. It was one of the most horrific pain that I felt in my whole life. And I had three C-sections, and this was worse than that. I loved my father dearly. The day that he passed away, I was called that he had a heart attack. I was rushed to the hospital, went to see my father. He was, I was told I could not talk about his finances. I was told I could not talk about his health. He was hooked up to machines and was in a coma. He was bruised and dark. He had a, a head injury. No one could tell me what was wrong because of the HIPAA laws. I was able to talk to a doctor later that day with my siblings who said that something happened with his lung and it caused a heart attack. We came the next morning to see him again and we were told we had 20 minutes to say goodbye to our father that this significant other that married him three months before he died <clears throat> was pulling the plug. I walked in there and my father was warm and he responded to my voice. I told him how much I loved him. I told him how much I wanted to be there with him, that we had never abandoned him, that we had fought for him. And I felt him move his finger in the palm of my hand and I said, my dad, my dad moved. He, he moved his finger. And the nurse said, well, he heard you. He heard you. He knows you're here. And I had to sit there for the next 20 minutes knowing that there was nothing I could do to stop them from pulling the plug on my father. I cried. My brother and I cried. My sister and I sobbed. We had a preacher come in who helped pray with us. We asked that he be given his last rites. He was Catholic. We were told no, there was not enough time to give him his last rites. I begged them, please let me be with my father when he passes. He should not pass alone. He was there at my birth. I want to be there with him when he passes. I was told no, you have to leave the hospital and we will call you when he is gone. This was the worst day of my life. It was so traumatic that today, four years later, I don't know why my dad died. I don't know what caused his death. I was told we couldn't get his ashes even though he had a burial plot next to his parents that he had paid for 30 years before. So I don't know where my dad is. I have no place to mourn him. His estate was completely given over to the CPA, to the lawyer, to the bookkeeper, to the finance manager, to the bank. 
and lastly, to this woman. There was nothing I could do. I vowed that day that I would never, ever stop until I could get this pain to never touch another living soul to have to go through this. I saw Carrie's protest. This happened right around when her father passed. In fact, her father, Kelly Rooney's father, Kimmy Rooney's father, all passed away within months of each other. I contacted her. We hit it off immediately, bonded by pain and bonded by love, love of our fathers. And this love has branched into Case and Cares. We are here to inform people of what is going on in the world right now, of how our elderly are being exploited, are being held as ATM machines, are having their voices taken away from there in, um, in their last life, the last moments of their life, and not being able to be with their loved ones, which they worked so hard their whole life to contribute to, to be with their families, and how they are basically being erased off the face of the earth, if not for us. I want to introduce you to a woman that stood by me through this, that loved me, that listened to me. She's a jack of all trades. She is the most giving person I've ever met in my life. She is the most loving daughter, sister, friend. And I'm very happy to introduce Carrie Kasem to you. Thank you so much. Whoa. Um, wow. Thank you, Kathy. I did not expect that. I didn't know she was going to do that. So thank you for that beautiful introduction. I, I, I feel so honored to be up here in front of all of you. This is my third year here at the CDAA. I want to thank Aaron Martinelli. This conference gets better every year, gets bigger every year. It's unbelievable. Um, I also want to thank Allison Peter and Lisa Caprelli. Uh, without them, this, this uh, combination, this conference with Case and Cares would not have happened. Um, just a little bit about Kathleen Wright Braun, who you just heard from. Case and Cares would not be where it's at without this woman. She donates her time, she donates her money, and we've, when we have victims call us, which is pretty much every single day, when there's a victim who she bonds with, Kathy will use her own money and get them a lawyer so that they can see their parent. And we had two major victories recently. We, um, a man was kidnapped for two years, taken to another state, and they tried to sell off all of his property. They isolated him. They wouldn't let his daughter talk to him. And we, uh, because, of, because of Kathy Braun here, we just won that case. And uh, Lori Martinez and her lawyer, who just won the case for her, will be talking tomorrow. Uh, he's one of, Mark Mermelstein, he's one of our um, speakers uh, for the Case and Cares uh, track we have, which will be right next door. So if you want to hear that story, it's amazing. Uh, and also, uh, he saved a woman from a fraudulent guardianship. 56-year-old woman put in a guardianship, uh, meaning all of her rights were stripped. She couldn't drive. She couldn't vote. She couldn't care for herself. She didn't have her money. And she had just gotten $400,000 because her dad died in an instant guardianship. We got her out of that, too. That story will be told as well. Um, how many of you we're here last year or the year before. So you've heard me speak. OK. I'm going to be speaking again next uh, tomorrow as well, talking about my story, any updates on my story. How many of you heard of my father, Casey Kasem, and what we went through in the media? Good. I'm also going to be dispelling some myths and uh, talking about things that we have found out in the last two years about what went on, because it's far <coughs> worse than what was out there in the news. 
I, I hope that we have some of you, you know, and, and you come and you join us for at least one of our speakers. Uh, we are trying to create awareness and there is nobody, I think, more apropos to talk to than this audience. You are on the front lines. You see it every day, whether it's isolation, physical abuse, financial abuse, sexual abuse. Whether it's an elderly person or a child, it's the same thing. Abuse is abuse. Today, we have the survivors panel. We don't call it the victims panel, survivors panel, because these people are survivors. They're all fighters, every single one of them. The first one I'd like to introduce you to is a woman named Julie Belshi. She's a guardian reform advocate. She has, and she's gonna, let, she's gonna tell her story, but she is an incredible woman who, oh, your phone's going off. Uh, it's okay. Popular woman. <laughs> whose parents were taken uh, from her fraudulently put into a guardianship and going pro se without a lawyer, won her parents back. The judge is off the bench, and the woman who did this had done this to hundreds of other people and is now behind bars with 207 felony accounts. <laughs> she was just written up in The New Yorker. Did any of you read that story? Yeah, there you go. Amazing article. So if you have if you have a chance, you want to read the New Yorker article article on um, Julie Belshi and uh, the fraudulent guardianship. We're also going to have a woman uh, tomorrow too, Diane Diamond. She's a journalist. She did a five part series called "Who Guards the Guardians," uh, and phenomenal, phenomenal article. And what she's been doing the last few years. She's speaking tomorrow at the conference as well. Oh, there's Olivia. Olivia? Olivia Robinson right there. She's going to speak as well. She's an investigator. This happened to her. She's speaking tomorrow with Mark Mermelstein. Um, so many incredible speakers, but I, I, I digress. Excuse me. Julie Belshi, do we have the, um, we're going to play a little bit of a video to introduce this incredible woman. <laughs> Um, just to give you a brief of what happened is my parents were taken in 2013. It was Labor Day weekend, and I live 15 minutes away from them. They were taken out of their house by a private for-profit guardian. She introduced herself as a officer of the court. She gave them three options. Option one was that they could go to an assisted living facility. Option two was they could go, they could, she could call the police and they could get taken out by a gurney by the fire department. Option three was they could go to a psych ward. Um, my dad asked for legal papers right away. He said, who are you and um, there was an agency over there that was helping my mom shower at the time and get ready. And what happened was my dad, to protect my mother, chose the most, I guess, the best option to go to the assisted living facility. They drove my parents 50 miles from our house, almost to Lake Mead, the border of Arizona, and um, I had plans with them that day, had called them a dozen times or more, called hospitals. Um, I was a wreck, drove out to their home, saw a newspaper in the front. Their house was closed down. It was closed down differently than they had normally closed it down. Um, composed myself, got in my car, came home, and I said, there's something terribly wrong. I told my husband, I just feel like there's something terribly wrong. They haven't called me. Why haven't they called me? My mom's usually always home. So he said, well, maybe they're both out together. or Maybe something happened, emergency. So I'm calling hospitals. The second day comes around. I'm still calling and calling. I drive out to their house, the same thing. More newspapers. The house is still locked down. The day number three comes, 
same thing. More newspapers, house still locked down. Day number four, first business day comes around on a Tuesday. There's a sign on their door, in case of emergency, contact April Parks, NCG, Guardian, 702-629-6200. That number is no longer in service, and her business is now no longer running as well. She was spiraling out of control. She was just about to get six hospitals in Las Vegas, Nevada, contracted with her. So... I called her immediately, and I said, where are my parents? And she said, Julie, Julie, this is legal. This is legal. And I said, no, there's nothing legal about this. You have violated my civil and constitutional rights and my parents. You never notified me. You never told me what happened. Um, where are my parents? Your parents are at Lakeview. Terrace. I said, fine, thank you. I knew I just did not want to talk to her. I wanted to go make sure my parents were physically and mentally okay. So my husband and I went over there. We spent approximately two weeks or three weeks um, spending between four and eight hours with my parents. Um, they had so quickly put them on so many medications um, my mom was on fentanyl. She was on 16 different medications. Um, they had my parents for 22 months, and my mom is five feet tall. She went from being 120 pounds to 185 pounds, not being able to even move, not being able to walk, not being able to open her eyes. My dad was sitting there. He was double visioning. I said, no, 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 no. I went to all these different attorneys with my husband, my poor husband, he's here today. I wanna to thank him so much because he is my backbone, my rock, and I could never have done this without him. He picked me up off the floor. I couldn't believe this was happening in my life. Um, I went to all different attorneys and I had to end up doing it myself, which I did. And um, every time I went in the courtroom, they said to me, Julie, you've got to get a judge. I mean, attorney, you have to get an attorney. And I'd say, yes, Your Honor, I'll get one next time. I've been looking. And I had, but I just couldn't afford it. Um, basically, to cut to the chase of this, um, we got my parents spent 22 months in assisted living facility. I went to the attorney general general, I went to the district attorney, I went to anybody and everybody I could because nobody would open their door for me. So I had to start opening the doors and I went on ABC, I went to Al Jazeera America, I went to the New Yorker, I just got done doing a documentary that's due to come out, it's going to be called The Guardian. Um, I've been working nonstop on this, and I am running the hotline at Kasem Cares um, Foundation, and I will never stop speaking about this and letting people know that just because they're older, they have a right to die with dignity. My parents, thank God, now are living with us. We got them out of the guardianship, and um, it's going, you know, it's a little bit tough, to be honest. Um, you know, they're 78 and 81, and uh, but they're, it's just an involvement, and um, we're very grateful. We've all learned a lot from this. Um, they lost everything. Um, we had our last court date with April Parks. We just got a default judgment um, for $8.5 million um, by the judge which I know is going to be hard to collect on. Um, but it was just something in me. It was a fire in me that nobody would listen to me. And everybody was looking at me like I was crazy. And I had to stand up for my parents' family first. If you can keep your family members at home, please keep them at home with a caretaker who loves them or take care of them yourself. They thrive at home. They thrive at home with my children. They thrive at home with the dog, the cat. 
it's, it's just healthier for them all around. Thank you very much for coming. Her father was a war veteran as well, and uh, April Parks, the Guardian, sold his Purple Heart, their house, the cars, and left them destitute. They have nothing. So Julie takes care of them completely, 100%, all of their needs. Uh, so, and that wasn't supposed to happen. Your parents had enough money for retirement, had enough money for everything, and now, now they have nothing. So I do hope you collect on some of that money, because, I mean, even though it won't give them back all their personal effects and everything, it would help. I'm glad that finally somebody said enough's enough because this is happening everywhere. And I don't wanna say that there's not good guardians out there. There are, there are. But the ones we deal with at Case and Cares are not good. Um, our next speaker is a member of the Case and Cares board. Carrie Jones went through the same thing and found me and my foundation and said, what can I do to help? What can I do? I went through this. I, 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 I don't want anybody else to go through this. And I said, why don't you come to a press you know, conference we're having down at the courthouse? And she was there, she showed up. What else can I do? Well, you wanna help with this thing or that thing or this, you know. Uh, it was, she, she was just there and I said, you gotta, you, you gotta come on board. But what's amazing about this woman is she had an entire career in entertainment. She was a pussycat doll. She, yeah, she was <laughs> making it and she quit everything to work at a law firm and to do what she could for victims like all of us. She stopped everything and said, this is, this is important enough. She's gonna tell her story of what happened and another, we have another superwoman up here. I love you, Carrie. <laughs> I love you too. <laughs> Carrie Jones, everyone. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> um, my story is about me and my great uncle. My great uncle married his second wife after his first wife passed away from a stroke. His second wife was waiting in the wings for him, basically. And after they got married, they were married maybe two years. <clears throat> who's still a grieving husband, missing his first wife, but she looked similar and was from the same country, and you know, she, but she wasn't quite as nice. Um, so after two years of them being married, my uncle was hit in the back of the head with the two before. Um, ironically, his wife is the one who found him. There was no police report filed at all. Um, he was in a coma for over a month. During that month, she had called my family in Illinois my uncle had no children. I'm the only blood relative in California. But she had called my family in Illinois to come out. And her, what, what, her, what she wanted to have done is she wanted our family to help her get everything put into her name. When my family refused to do that, that's when isolation started. My uncle came out of the coma. She had control. He relied on her for medical, physical, um, even eating, she would supposedly cook for him, but she isolated him from our family. And this went over the course of about 20 years. We would still be able to have a, a weekly phone call with him. She would be screaming and yelling in the background, but every week on a Sunday, we would talk to him. All of a sudden, about four years ago, I get a phone call from my family saying that that weekly phone call was no longer happening. They could not reach him. They couldn't get a hold of him. They asked me. They said, can you go by the house? Can you see you know, if he's OK? Because we're scared that he's dead in the house. I went to the house. I banged on the doors, banged on the windows. His wife wasn't answering the door for me. I was the enemy. I was family. So then I went to the fire department, police department. They couldn't tell me anything because of the HIPAA law, which I had to finally understand. Um, so I drew up on Google Maps. I did a search of every skilled nursing facility, board and care, hospital, within a 20 to 30 mile radius of where he was. That started my two week venture of trying to locate this man, who's my great uncle. I don't have any grandparents that are still alive, so I'm gonna find this man. I'm going to take care of him. If it's the last thing I do, I'm going to find him. 
So I walked, uh, I started, first of all, I started calling hospitals and nursing homes. They couldn't tell me if he was there. So then I realized, okay, after the first couple of times that you can't tell me he's there, then I'm gonna get smart and I'm gonna start walking up and down each hall of each one of these facilities acting like I'm visiting. So I started walking up and down the halls looking for his nameplate on the door. About the 30th place, not kidding, two weeks, maybe the 30th place, I found him sitting in the hall of Santa Anita convalescent. When I saw him, he didn't have his own shoes, he didn't have his own clothes, he didn't have glasses, disoriented, and I walked up to him and I grabbed his hand and I said, Uncle Ray, I'm your niece, Carrie, remember me? And he grabbed my hands and this is something that I will never forget that changed my life. He said, I was beginning to think no one would find me in here. At that moment, my life changed and I took charge of everything. I, he began to tell me the process of how he was abused by his, first, uh, by his second wife. How whenever they disagreed, she would beat him with a cane. Sadly, I found that there was a cane in every single room of their home. So she ripped him out of the nursing home once she found out that I started visiting. Came out, almost like Carrie's story, came out, ripped him out of the nursing home against doctor's orders, against social workers, begging, I'm begging them not to do that. Two weeks later, I get a phone call from his second wife and said that he had fallen and I came to the house and it was Thanksgiving day. I came to the house, blood pouring down the steps and he came out with masking tape wrapped around his face and cotton balls stuffed up his nose and she threw her walker at me and she said, you do not call the paramedics. And I said, you know what, this is over. So my boyfriend and I got him in my car, drove a block to the emergency room, and he never saw her again. He gave me power of attorney. I was granted power of attorney. I got him into an assisted living. I took care of everything, and for the first time, my uncle was able to see family members. We started flying out from, from Illinois, just one right after the other, visiting, sharing stories. So I promised him, he passed away, but I will tell you, he passed away knowing that he was loved by his family. And that to me was the most important thing. And I told him that I will fight for what he wants and I will fight every step of the way. And so I'm so honored that I'm a part of this group because we are making a change and I'm giving a voice to my uncle who could not give a voice for himself. And I'm doing that right now with Kaysom Cares. So thank you all for listening, thank you. Um, up next, we have a woman who is another fighter with a horrible story, but she's strong. She has an incredible husband who's very supportive. And we have been following her story with the Case and Cares documentary. She's also someone who has come out to lobby for bills, give her testimony. She flew out to Nebraska she has gone to the California Senate and to the Assembly, working on bills every single year, trying to protect the elderly. She's written them. She has a story that is similar to ours, every single one of ours. But it's, it's also devastating, because doing the documentary, we have found out so much more about what went on with her dad and what really happened. Phyllis Kalbach, you're an amazing woman and I'm so proud to have you as part of the team. Phyllis Kalbach, everybody. Houston, we have a problem. Let me explain. My father, Philip Suttles, passed away September of 2013 in Covington, Tennessee. He was 95 years old. He was a veteran of World War II and the Korean War. He had been diagnosed by the Veterans Hospital at Mather, California with dementia. He was blind in one eye and was going blind in the other eye. He had suffered strokes. He could barely hear. His brain had shrunk. And according to doctors, he was only going to get worse. Professional thieves, a woman named Margie, her daughters her, and granddaughter, and later we found out lawyers 
who were assigned by the courts to protect him, took him away from his home and family in, in California to Tennessee. They stole absolutely every single thing he owned, and they left him in the street in Tennessee to die. The police picked him up. He was injured. They didn't know who he was or where he belonged. A nurse took him home with her and nursed him until he died. When the thieves took him to Tennessee, my father owned homes, property, bank accounts, investments. He had no bills. He had a loving family who cared for him. When he died, he was penniless. He was surrounded by strangers. Bill collectors had been harassing my family because the thieves not only stole absolutely everything he owned, they took out loans in his name. And they charged up all of his credit cards. He is buried in Tennessee, even though he had previously purchased a burial site next to my mother, his, his deceased wife, out here in California. He had even purchased a headstone. He had, my father was targeted, robbed, isolated, and left in the street to die by these professional criminals, and oh, they knew exactly what they were doing. This is what they do for a living. They befriend their vulnerable victim, isolate them from their family and friends, and begin stealing from them. Margie and her daughters married or befriended elderly disabled men and stole from them. Margie had, as far as we know, about five husbands. They had all died, but she never married my father because she didn't really have to. At one point, and I am going to quote this, she looked, she looked at me and said, Phyllis, you don't understand. I'm taking everything he's got, absolutely everything, and there's nothing you can do about it because he is going to give it to me. And she knew exactly what she was talking about. My family went to the police, to the bank, to social services, to the veterans hospital, to lawyers, and to the courts, and to the newspapers. No one would help us. The reasons for not helping, them, helping us ranged from the absurd to the outrageous. We were told, civil, not criminal, not our agency's responsibility, not our problem, can't talk to you, can't turn over medical records to the court, secret, not our problem, get a lawyer, they all said, <coughs> civil, not criminal. Family squabble, rich people fighting over money, nobody cares anymore, not interesting enough for the press. So we went to the lawyers and soon discovered how that works. They wanted money, no limits. How much are you worth, they said. How much equity in your homes do you have? Do you have retirement plans, savings, college funds? Can you borrow? What is your father's life worth to you? Yes, the lawyer said, we could absolutely lose. Your father hates you kids now and likes his new friends. You have no proof he has dementia. Doctors won't give you the medical records. The courts, they don't care. You have nothing to say in court. Everything you say is subjective because you are family and are only interested in money. His new friends are his caregivers. Well, we learned that when the money runs out, the lawyers run and the courts just shrug. However, the courts did assign him an attorney as his guardian. In the absence of medical records, his lawyer assessed him to have no sign of dementia. Now everything was done behind closed doors and in secret. His new friends are now his family. We could no longer see him. Lawyers quickly had him sign a trust, putting his property into their names. My father loved his house and wanted to stay there. He never would have given his home over to a person he had just met. How did they get him to sign those papers? What did they tell him? We were not allowed to know. His retirement checks came each month into his checking account, and Margie, it appears, was still in charge of that. My father disappeared, and so did his property. No one was coming to help us to fight. No one. In 2015, I was elected as a delegate and to a seat on the executive board of the state, California State Democratic Party. 
At the Democratic Party's state convention, I addressed the senior caucus concerning financial abuse about what happened to my family. After I spoke and throughout the rest of the convention, people approached me. That happened to me, they said. That happened to me. That happened to my neighbor. I thought I was the only one. I am so ashamed. I could not protect my mother, my father. The lawyers took my house. The lawyers took our savings. The thieves took my parents away, and their life savings disappeared. Our reputations were destroyed. One man came to me with tears in his eyes, and he said to me, his lawyer, he says, my lawyer took $45,000, and then told me, your mother's not worth any more than this. Just let the thieves take the rest. The man broke down crying. He wanted me to tell what happened but not to use his name. He is so ashamed. Crimes against the vulnerable is the crime of the 21st century. The National Center for Victims of Crimes puts the annual cost of financial fraud in the 40 to $50 billion range. Not everyone wants to report these crimes. Admitting you got confused and were conned is humiliating and frightening. The Census Bureau currently projects that the baby boom population will total 61.3 million by, two, by 2029. <laughs> and financial experts estimate that they control nearly 70% of the nation's wealth. Over the next few years, $30 trillion will be transferred from one generation to the next. Professional thieves are prepared to transfer as much of this wealth as possible into their own pockets. Fleecing the elderly is big business, and we are not prepared. So what can we do? What must we do? We are a country of laws, but when it comes to undue influence, our culture is still in the Middle Ages. At that time, in the Middle Ages, Lawyers interpreted the king's law and made legal and financial decisions. They also believed the world was flat, and they had no knowledge of how the brain operates. They believed in witchcraft. Shakespeare did allude to undue influence in Macbeth. The, witcher, the witches whispered destructive thoughts into the minds of the characters, causing them to make destructive, irrational decisions. Today, we are light years away from the Middle Ages in our knowledge about how our minds work and how our brains work. The world has changed, but our laws are lagging behind. We must move into the 21st century. In all cases, crimes including murder, rape, robbery, spousal, child, and even animal abuse are considered criminal and civil is optional. However, elder abuse using undue influence is considered civil. Thus, criminals act with impunity as abuse reports are passed from one agency to another with each agency denying responsibility and with no action taken. Penal Code 368 is clear that undue influence is criminal and our law enforcement is absolutely devoted to protecting our vulnerable citizens. However, we are lacking the legal and organizational tools to protect our citizens. There is no clear modern definition in our criminal code 368 describing undue influence. The prior definition of undue influence was enacted in 1872. On January 1st, 2014, a modern definition was incorporated into California Probate Code and Welfare and Institutions Code. However, it has not been added to our California Criminal Code. This must be done. There is a proposal at the state now proposing this. Lawyers or other non-board certified medical persons must never make medical decisions about a client's competency or maintain a doctor's on payroll who will do exactly what they are instructed. 
property transfers must never be made in secret. Legal heirs must be contacted and have a voice when wills or trusts are written and or changed. Family members or friends must never be isolated. Professional experts must be available to law enforcement, education, and how to care for the aging has got to be available for the general public and for everyone. We must come together and solve this problem together or every person in this room, everyone you know and everyone you love may become a victim. No matter how rich you are, how poor you are, or how smart or educated you are, you may become a victim. No one, no one will come to help you to fight. And it is going to take courage to change our culture and to bring it into the 21st century because there is billions of dollars at stake. We must stand together and help each other. We will solve this problem. Thank you. Another woman and her sister, who I love dearly, Kelly and Kimmy Rooney. Kelly Rooney helped me fight for the first bill in California. When I decided, when I went through, you know, I talked to the police and they couldn't help, they did a welfare check, talked to Adult Protective Services and there was nothing that they could do, I thought, okay, the courts could help. I went to court and I soon realized there was nothing the court could do because they had no jurisdiction, they had no law that they could cite that said that they could just give visitation to kids that wanted it or somebody who was isolated. We had to fight, go through an entire fight over power of attorney or guardianship. Even though my father told Judge Leslie Green, I want to see my children, told the court appointed doctor, I want to see my children, told the PVP attorney, I wanted to see my children, he was emphatic and we had him on film and we had a power of attorney. The judge could not rule on visitation. Unbelievable. Kelly Rooney, she found me. She said, my dad's going through the same thing. Mickey Rooney. Mickey Rooney spoke in front of the Congress and said he was being abused and still nothing was done. Mm -hmm. Kelly came and met me at the Capitol in Sacramento and she testified with me. Her sister, Kimmy, stood by us. She's come to every event. She has been there in spirit and she has been there physically and she is a powerhouse as well. These two women love their dad, fight for his legacy, and are with Case and Cares. So please give a round of applause to Kelly and Kimmy Rooney. As Carrie said, my name is Kelly Rooney and I am Mickey Rooney's daughter. His first girl, the oldest of four, and one of many. This is my baby sister, four years apart, born on the same day and we are very close. And I'm proud that she's sitting here next to me to support me today. When this happened to our dad, it was a slow isolation that gradually became more and more difficult through the years. One of my sisters and I made surprise visits that when our dad had opened up to us about the abuse he was suffering, he shared with us that he was very, very, afraid and wanted us to trust one of our stepbrothers who lived in the house with his wife. My dad had been taking care of them because they had no jobs. We begged him that day to leave with us after he shared our stepmother and one of her sons was harming him. He said, no, no, I don't want it to happen this way. I don't want it to get out publicly. This would be the last time we ever saw our dad. The neighbors told us later that they had called special services several times, hearing screaming coming from his home. My sister and I were very upset, and we didn't want to leave without him. We kept begging him to come with us. I made him promise to call 911 if anyone would, was hurting him. Before we left that day, he reassured us that he would and that we would all be together very soon. My sister and I went to the car 
and just fell apart. Wondering what it is we could do. At one point, I couldn't contact him. This happened many times. I called the police twice. We had made a pact with dad before we left and a stepbrother that as soon as they had gotten him out of the house and safe, we could take care of him. Then they, my stepbrother and his wife, positioned themselves after dad had called 911 and went before a judge. They had no jobs and told the judge they would be his caretakers. The judge then gave our dad an attorney to look over his affairs. Each of us kids spoke to this attorney many, many times. He knew that we wanted to take care of our dad and financially we were capable to do so and expressed just how much we loved him. This attorney just kept playing us, wasting time, making more excuses every time we called. Now another form of isolation has begun. Our dad took trust in a stepbrother and my stepbrother's wife and the attorney who lied to us and were lying to him. They never called us like they had said they would. Dad's wife, her two sons, and their wives were all wanting us out of their way and dad's life altogether. They made excuses all the time. It was so difficult to discern and to believe anything that anyone would say to us. They withheld food and medication from him to control him and isolate him. Dad had been in his conservatorship for 18 months when he passed away, and no one, not his wife, her two sons, their wives, the attorney from the court, ever called to let us know that Dad had passed away. We heard of his death on TMZ Live. We called Mr. Augustine, the attorney, every week, asking him for Dad's phone number and address so we could go and see him which he denied to give us every time. We had been treated as if we were isolating and abusing him. And now at this point, he was put into different hands altogether, which kept us children and our father from seeing one another. This went on and on and was so frustrating and painful not to be able to help our dad. We heard from many of his friends the awful truth after he passed away about my stepbrother and his wife and his treatment. After his passing, we were in court for two weeks trying to claim his body to bury him. No one, no one would tell us where he was. No one was letting us know anything. We were left to know nothing and so was our dad. Even in his death, Two weeks before he passed, he was forced to change his wishes, which is a red flag for everyone. They tried to make us look as if we didn't care. This was so far from the truth, and the truth is, we do love him, and he knows we love him. We believe they all abused him, his wife, her sons, their wives, and the attorney. We only pray others will not have to go through what so many are going through. No man, no woman, no child, no court should keep loved ones from the ones they love, not ever. We will use what God and our dad gave us, our name, for awareness to honor life and give dignity for all people, maybe one day even our own. Before I close, I would like to share a quote from my dad when he went to Capitol Hill and testified before Congress. To those seniors and especially elderly veterans like myself, I want to tell you this, you are not alone. 
and you have nothing to be ashamed of. If elder abuse happened to me, it can happen to anyone. I want you to know you deserve better. Thank you so much for being here. Thank you, Kelly. Kimmy, did you want to say a few words? Kimmy? No, I just, I'm just, thank you. Hello, everybody. Um, it's always hard to speak after that. You know, it's the reality of it is very strong. Um, I'm sorry. I think that we just all really, I think all of us here, of course, are aware, but it is, I just want to say this, that it's not about us or, or just us up here. It's about every single person in this room on the face of the earth. Anything can happen to anybody at any time. Doesn't ha you don't have to be elderly. You don't have to be young. Like Carrie said earlier, abuse is abuse. And I think the world looks away because it's so evil. But I think the more we talk about it, I think together the stronger the, the world can become and not be so afraid to mention it if you see something or you know something. Because saying one thing, just one thing, can save somebody's life. So thank you very much. And thank you, Carrie. I love you, Kelly. Thank you. <laughs> thank you, thank Kimmy. Thank you, everybody. Thank you. I, I love these guys, Trudy and Travis Campbell. Please give them a warm welcome. Well, I guess I guess Travis is going to let me talk. I'm actually Travis's wife, and um, we live in Kansas. I grew up in a uh, ranching community. My family's in the land, cattle, and oil business, and Travis grew up in the entertainment business. And believe it or not, in 2014, Travis had suffered a stroke and a heart attack, and he was in a coma. And during that time, and I get teared up like everybody else here on the panel, but uh, I was told that he had no brain activity and uh, that I'd probably never see him alive again. During that time, I prayed a lot, but one of the things that I look back on is I remembered how before he'd had his cardiac arrest and stroke, how he had tried and attempted to see his father and the stress that he was under during that time. And my dad was killed in a wheat truck wreck on June 24th in 1980. This was in June when Travis, it was June the 18th when he had his stroke and heart attack. And I thought when he was on life support and in his coma, I thought if we can hold off until the 24th, a miracle will happen. A miracle happened. Travis woke up. He came out of that coma. So this is a survivor's panel. And he is definitely a survivor. And I think that God spared his life so that he could go on and tell everything that's happened with his father, just like everything that's happened with all the entire panel here. Because if it could happen to Glenn Campbell, it could happen to anybody. So ladies and gentlemen, I'd like to introduce you to my wonderful husband, Travis Campbell. Hello there. Um, I'm a little nervous. I've never done this before, so kind of bear with me. But um, um, I'll start kind of at how it all happened. Um, my sister and I found out that my dad was placed in a, in a home, a memory care facility, via the media, which is an awful way to find out. Um, in any event, we went down to, to see him there. They, they let us in the, the, the first day. And then when, when I came back the second day, they said that, that Glenn didn't need any visitors that day. Um, I immediately got on the phone to my stepmom and said, listen, unless you let me in, um, you know, I'm gonna have the, the press down here. Um, she was in New York doing a red carpet um, function for the documentary that, that she did during my father's f supposed farewell tour. But, um, I try to be objective. Um, it's hard. It's hard to be objective. Um, I find 
well, let me back up a little bit. I mean, af after that, we ended up having to, 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 I had to get an attorney. We had to start that whole process. And, um, and obviously she pretty much had unlimited means. So it was, it was very, very hard to do. It was very draining financially. And, and towards the end, um, I mean, in a way I'm still going through it. Um, but getting back to, getting back to um, with, with empathy. Um, I feel that, that someone that is void, too loud, I'm sorry. <laughs> I feel that someone that is void of, of empathy is seriously misguided and, and, and greatly confused. Um, I try to be, I tried to be empathetic towards her, knowing that, that um, somewhere in there, there had to be some sort of love that she had for my father. Um, and you know it's very hard. I mean, I'm 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 a Christian, and I, I I pray for her. I try to lift her up, but it's just it's hard. It's hard to do. It really is if people are in that situation. Um, in any event, I I just would I think she she had no empathy or, and could not consider the fact that how much I love my dad. Uh, wow, excuse me. It's just kind of hard because it's fresh. I mean, she, he just passed away. You know, a couple months ago, a few months ago. And it's still kind of painful, but um, in any event, what what happened was when he was diagnosed with Alzheimer's, um, he it was you know later pretty much after he was diagnosed with Alzheimer's, she thought it'd be a great idea for him to do a you know a farewell tour, um, you know which which my you know my dad enjoyed performing, but but what she did is she fired his old band of 35 years. My sister sang with my father for over 35 years. Um, I mean, his sound checks were just, you know, making sure that the volume was okay on the mics. So she fired his old band to save money and, and they did, it was supposed to be a, a 12 day tour. Um, I guess they, it's, they, they sold out and I guess she made lots of money. So she proceeded to keep him on the road for three years, okay? 151 dates, okay? And the this, this shows were sold out and then she had this brilliant idea to document all this in a documentary. Okay, I, uh, I'm all for, you know, bringing awareness to Alzheimer's, but not to the point of disrespecting my father. They, I I'm not sure if any of you have seen the documentary, it's called All Be Me. I mean, I can't even believe I'm promoting it. But, um, <laughs> <laughs> but uh, <laughs> they, show him they show him urinating in a corner, licking a plate, all the while portraying my mother as this incredible caregiver. Um, you know, when I, you know, in my opinion, he'd, he'd had much more fun spending the last few cognizant years of his life golfing with his buddies, okay? My father hated the cold, okay? He lived in Phoenix for a while, and then, but he lived in Malibu the majority, you know, of his end of, the, of his life. He didn't like Nashville because it was cold. He didn't like the cold, okay? After, after the tour, and, and the tour had to conclude with him breaking down on stage. They, okay, they followed the tour around for two and a half years. Finally, in Napa, California, he breaks down on stage, can no longer function. Okay, so they, they said, oh, mercifully, or, you know, compassionately, we, we won't make him go anymore. So that's kind of how the, the All Be Me documentary ended. Um, and then right after that, she sells the home in Malibu, moves to Nashville, in my opinion, to get all his industry contacts, buys a nice home in Nashville, and then puts him in a, a, home, a memory care facility. Um, that's you know where, where I started with, where we went to try to see him. Um, I mean, I'm of the opinion that, that someone said that, I mean, caregiving at home is, is so much better than placing someone you know, in, in a facility. And he had the means, she, she could have had him there 24 hours a day. I mean, she could have had care 24 hours a day for him. Um, you know, but she chose instead to place him in a home. I mean, in my opinion, again, because it was inconvenient for her. Um, she was off doing these premieres. You know, she, she'd get paid 10000 a pop to speak at these premieres for All Be Me. And, um, and, and again, I, I, I don't want to sound completely <laughs> agitated. I mean, I, I kind of am, but, but I, again, I try to be objective. Um, when, when I first saw my father that, that day when we went in there, he looked at me and he said, son, he said, please get me out of this crap hole. Okay, he used a different word than crap. And that's when I started my efforts, you know, to try to get him out or try to do anything, you know, to help him out. I mean, he can be taken care of at home. And, and obviously the, the wife, um, 
has, you know, the the rights, you know, and and she she just, I mean, just buried us in, in litigation, and you know, at that time, you know, we didn't have an attorney, and, and Carrie was has been, you know, so helpful, um, but it's it's just beyond, you know, again, I mean, it's it's just it's hard, you know, I mean, buried you know us in litigation, and when when your father says to you, please get me out of here. I mean, what can you do? You know, you, you got to try. You know, and I mean, I, I must say that one, one very special moment that I, I have. Um, I'm sure some of you are familiar with Alzheimer's, but they towards the end they kind of, you know, they're not really there. And uh, and and as it worked out, I mean, we're pretty much forced into a mediated agreement um, that I could see my father uh, for four hours a month. Okay, twice a month, and that's all I could see him. So I, I cherish those, those times. And they wouldn't even let my wife in, you know? They wouldn't even, because she didn't get along. Um, and I, again, I, I'm trying not to be spiteful, but if, if, if you went against my stepmother, as, as Carrie mentioned, um, you know, she would do everything in her power to, to shut you off. I mean, if you went against her, the, you know, family members, you know, the purse string stopped. You know, if you went against her towards the end of, the, of the, my father's life, you w didn't have access to my father. And, um, but the, but, but the thing I'll cherish the most is I'm sitting there with him and, you know, we're just sitting there for a few hours and he's talking and, and I mean, some, a lot of times it's mumble jumble, this was towards the end. But finally he, he, he looks at me and you can see something click in his mind. He looks at me and he got this big old smile on his face. He said, I sure love you, son. You know, I mean, that's, that's to me, that's worth anything. I mean, I mean that, that's, that's what I'm going to carry with me. I mean, and it, it got so bad towards the end. Um, when, when he was passing away um, in, in Nashville, I was actually driving down to Nashville. We were on the road, and, and we would found out that he'd passed. But I come to find out at the funeral, she wouldn't even let me be pallbearer for my father. She made me sit in the back, wouldn't even let me be pallbearer. She wouldn't let my sister into the room when my dad, you know, was in the final you know, right, right before it passed away. And, um, you know, in caregiving, care, I'll wrap up, oh, I'm getting close. Caregiving, in my opinion, caregiving is, I, I have a friend that um, she, she her, her mother um, had, was diagnosed with Alzheimer's. She had an accountant, accountancy firm. What she did is she had to quit her job, um, you know, I mean, not quit her job. She, I mean, she dissolved her company, kept some of the clients, you know, that she had and worked at home, brought her mom into the house, and um, basically her life stopped, okay, taking care of, of, of her mother with Alzheimer's. That's caregiving, okay? Caregiving is not just throwing someone in a home. I mean, that's, in my opinion, that's, oh, I got five minutes? Okay, I'm okay. <laughs> 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 I'm sorry, I'm just a little nervous. Um, <laughs> You know, that's not the caregiving. Um, it's, uh, you know, to, like they said, I mean, to, to, to be taken care of at home, I mean, she had the means to, to be able to take care. He could have around the clock um, care when, you know, was there. And, and then also to, um, to be d discluded um, is, it's just a tough thing. Um, I mean, I know that, you know, with step parents and, you know, step children, it's, Sometimes it's tough. I mean, it doesn't have to be. You know, it doesn't have to be. Um, I'm not sure what else. Oh, um, the other thing I want to say is that it's, um, it's, I mean, a lot of times the media, um, it, it's, it's more known or, or in the media when, when, when fathers of notable people, um, when this happens to fathers of, of notable people, um, you know, Carrie, the Rooney's, I mean, every, everybody on here. And, but this happens to, to people, you know, uh, every day, all the time. Um, I mean, when someone, you know, saves their life savings and wants to either pass that on to their children or, you know, whatever, you know, whatever their intentions were for that, and someone comes along and, you know, and, and takes, it, takes it away, I mean, that, that's, cr I mean, I mean, I'm not a lawyer, but I play one on TV, though. But, uh, <laughs> <laughs> but I mean, <laughs> that's criminal. You know, I mean, I, I, I don't, I'm not on TV. But um, <laughs> I'm sorry. I, I, had, I had something written, but uh, I just, I was like, it was a book, and I, there's no way. <laughs> you know. But, um, and then the, the last thing I wanted to say 
is with regard to, I, I think, in my opinion, it was elder abuse. Um, you know, but a lot of people said, oh, oh, he loved it. I'm sure he loved the first few shows that he did, but I'm sure he did not enjoy being on the road two and a half years. No. He's been on the road his whole life. Okay, he enjoyed golfing with his friends. Um, I, in my opinion, it, it should be a crime that she basically just monetarily used him to the last uh, breath, you know? I mean, I c he called it the final tour. I called it, for her, the last dash for cash money train, you know? Um, it, and, and, then, and then when she was done, when, when he finally broke down and they were able to finish the documentary, then she sells the house in Malibu, moves him to Nashua where he didn't even like being in the first place, and sticks him in a home. I mean, you know, people, it's just, you know, and then a lot of, and then she's making us out to be the bad people, you know? I mean, she's trying to say that we want, all we, all, all our action was was to have a, 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 an in, a judge, um, uh, you know, appoint an independent, you know, third party to, to look over his finances so she's not messing things around at the end. Okay, I'm getting a high sign. But um, anyways, I'm, I'm, thank you for allowing me to be here. I'm honored to speak. Carrie, thank you so much, and, and everybody on here. I mean, I've met most of these people before, and um, you know, and thank you. <laughs> thank you, Travis and Trudy. Um, I know that it was very hard for you to do this. I know that he was very nervous. And I think you did a, a fine job, yes. and you didn't even need your notes. So that was <laughs> fantastic. <laughs> this summer, I got to speak at the United Nations, uh, being an ambassador for United H for Human Rights. And that was an incredible experience, because what this is is a human rights situation. Mm -hmm. What's going on here is people's human rights are being violated. Mm -hmm. It's that simple. That's what this is, and we are fighting. We are human rights crusaders up here. But anyway, my, the last speaker is uh, very close to my heart because she's my sister. <laughs> and um, I was out kind of on the front lines in the media and fighting and doing the bill and fighting for my dad and doing it. She, though, once we did get my dad back, and I did win conservatorship over my father, and we had to chase him down through the country because my stepmother took him on Mr. Toad's wild ride in her SUV, driving him everywhere, and that's when he got deathly ill and he had a bed sore and a lung infection and a um, urinary tract infection, kidney infection, and he got all these um, ailments on her ride to hide him from us from California to Las Vegas, possibly Arizona, back to Vegas, and then to Washington State. Um, when we found him in Washington State, he was in a really bad way, but my conservatorship wasn't good there. So I had to go and fight in court to have my conservatorship upheld. Now, Three weeks before this, my dad was fine. He didn't have, now he was sick. He had Lewy body dementia, but he could still talk. He could still smile, he could still hug us. We hadn't seen him in months, but I won. And well, what happened was, believe this or not, TMZ called me and said, we found where she's hiding your dad. <laughs> and uh, eventually we got into Berkeley East Convalescent Center and I called my sister and we had a, my lawyer there and, and my fiance and um, the man who owned the, uh, the facility and the, the nurses who ran it, they were all in there and they said we'd never seen Casey so animated before because when we walked in he had the biggest smile on his face and he sat up and he was so happy to see us. We'd been fighting for months and months and months to see my dad and he was so happy. Now that night, because we got a visitation at 2.30 in the morning, she took him out of there. My stepmother unhooked his feeding tube, his IVs, put, threw him in the back of an SUV. This is all on tape, by the way. And rolled him out of there. Um, against medical advice. That's right. <laughs> against medical advice, against doctor's advice. And Dr. Paul Leitner wrote a letter stating what Gene Kasem did would put my father in harm's way or kill him. Now, if a woman had a preemie baby 
And she decided, oh, I'm going to take that baby out of the hospital because I want to take him home. And that baby was dead three weeks later. You better believe she would be rung up on charges. You do that to an elderly person, nothing. <laughs> nothing. He was dead weeks later. My sister then was the strong one. My sister, while we were in the hospital trying to save my dad's life, took over because that wasn't my strong suit. <laughs> I can fight and fight and fight, but when it comes to the fight is over, your dad's not going to make it, it is futile, the more fluids you give him, you are going to drown him in his own fluids, or you're going to let him die peacefully with pain meds. And I couldn't hear that. I couldn't accept that. And my sister said, when a person dies, they don't want to drink water. They don't want to eat. This is going to happen where he doesn't feel pain. And it's going to be peaceful. Because my sister is a physician's assistant and worked in palliative care at the veterans hospital. So she knew. And she was the strong one for our family at the end. But she was with me through this entire fight. So was my brother and my entire family and all of my dad's friends. So I thank you, Sissy, for being that strong one. I love you. And this is my sister, Julie Kasem. Everything everybody has said is exactly what happened to us and the the sort of the common thread here is isolation 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 and that's sort of what i'm going to talk about today i cannot stress it enough that isolation is the first warning sign that you know something is wrong <clears throat> i don't know how many of you are on the front lines but i'm assuming a lot of you are and if you hear that word come out of somebody's mouth please please investigate further and take it seriously because unfortunately that wasn't done in our case. But at any rate, so uh, yes, my name's Julie. Um, we, uh, my brother Mike and my sister Carrie and I had like the best relationship with my dad. He was the best dad, just cared so much about us, loved us to no end, loved his family. All that he ever said, he would say, you know, if people ask you if you're rich, you tell them you're rich in love, because that's what you really are rich in. And it, I, I tell my kids that all the time. Um, and that's truly how he felt. So anyway, we had a wonderful relationship with him. We knew that um, as my dad got more ill that we were going to be isolated from him. This was my stepmom's M.O. from the day she married him, even though they were married oh, many, 30 years plus, whatever. We just knew that this was coming down the pike. So um, you're going to have to hear the whole story from my sister tomorrow. It's so complicated and there's so much but basically what I wanted to say is in August of 2013 we were essentially fully isolated from my dad and um, he, he was not able to drive at that point and so he, she had a driver come bring him to our house every week on a Sunday and it was wonderful and we got to spend a lot of time with him and he got to see my children and everything was great and then one day it just stopped and she gave well no don't worry the driver's coming and uh, you know he's busy right now so he can't take your dad to your house okay well I'll come visit him there no you can't come to our house to visit him okay well I'll pick him up and bring him to my house no you can't do that either and don't worry you'll be able to see him you'll be able to see him two weeks went by three weeks went by four weeks went by five weeks went by I finally said enough is enough I drove over to the house went into the gate was open drove in there she was and I said, I'm here to see my dad. She's like, well, you're not going to see him. And I said, well, my dad is ill. He had, at the time, we thought it was Parkinson's, but it was Lewy body dementia, which is very similar. I said, you're not understanding that this is when my dad needs his family the most. When someone is ill is when they need love around them and support around them the most. And she said, you know that when your dad dies, you're getting a million dollars. That's what she said to me. I said you can give me a million dollars right now to walk out of here and I wouldn't do it. I'm here to see my dad. This isn't about money. Well, you think you're going to be able to see your dad every week? I, yeah, I do. That's my dad. That's blood, you know. Well, you're not and I'll call you when we're ready for you to c see him. Well, I knew what that meant. So I 
was hysterical, I was bawling. And I'm not strong like my sister, like <laughs> that's just not me, I'm not good at confrontation. The fact that I even drove over there was like, that was like divine intervention because I would never <laughs> usually do that. <laughs> like, I'm like, anyway, so I called my sister and she's like, enough is enough, we're calling LAPD to go do a welfare check, we don't even know if he's okay. Called it all protective services, LAPD goes over there, it's all protective services goes over there. Long story short, they go in, well, he's got a 24 hour caregiver, he's living in a multi-million dollar home. He's fed, he's clothed, I, there's no problem here. You guys are some whiny children that clearly have a problem with your stepmother and so figure it out. I mean, they laughed at my sister, literally laughed at her when she called and they were like, oh, just kids wanting money. I mean, like, just because you have money doesn't mean that that's what your MO is. Like, that's, that's just because someone has money doesn't mean that the kids are greedy and they want it. It is, it's like, it's like, it's like my dad was punished for having money, literally punished. It was horrible. At any rate, so again, what I want to drive home is when you go out there to do these welfare checks, they might be clothed, they might be fed, they may have everything they need at their disposal, they may have their diaper changed, they may not have bruises, they may not be bleeding, but that's, those are the tangible signs. You have to look at the intangible signs, and I, it's hard to do, and I get it, and resources are limited, and I understand all of that. And I understand you kind of need to triage cases and go with the worst, right? The ones that are completely neglected and don't have caregivers and aren't cleaned. And I've seen it in my practice. I get it. But please, please, please look for isolation because isolation is literally the first sign of what's to come. And what came for my dad was is literally like, uh, like the worst abuse I mean, starving somebody for 10 days is like, are you kidding me? Like, uh, you'll have to listen to my sister tomorrow to hear the whole story. It is unbelievable the physical abuse that followed. And I feel like it could have potentially been blocked if, you know, the authorities were able to take our claim seriously because, you know, I, it's, like, it's like, you know, physical abuse is is considered abuse and it's like isolation is also considered abuse and I think everybody knows that but it's just not taken seriously and it needs to be taken as seriously as if you saw someone being hit by a two by four. It's the same thing. Isolation is abuse and what comes after isolation is financial abuse, sexual abuse, mental abuse, uh, you know, isolation. That's what follows. So I just, I don't know, I, I just... And I could go on and on and on, but I, I think my purpose here is to just please, you know, take isolation seriously. And when, you know, even though the person is, you know, has a wife or has a caregiver and is totally cared for and have everything they need and living in Malibu and whatever, it's like, that it's, it's, ah, it's so frustrating. But I just, I, 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 I just, that's, I guess that's what I want to say. And, um, same thing, you know, not being able to see dad. Again, t she took him to a nursing home, same thing. We couldn't see him at the nursing home. I mean, it's just, it's so wrong on so many levels. And again, and one thing else I wanna say is they will easily demonize the loved ones and the family. I'm sure you guys have seen it over and over again. And she constantly told the media that we were toxic and that's why we weren't, that we were, um, we didn't have a good relationship with my dad. And the reason we wanted to go see him was to get papers signed and like, you know, sign over d financial documents and we're toxic children and we're so horrible. And the reason she took him to Washington was to get away from the media circus that was these terrible children. You know, it's like, there was no media circus until you stopped letting us see him. We had no choice. I mean. It goes on and on, but we had to, so anyway, uh, you know, APS, LAPD couldn't do anything. We ended up going to court, spending thousands of dollars to try and fight in court. The courts couldn't do anything because there's no law regarding visitation. Now there is because of the Case and Cares Foundation. And it's wonderful, thank God, you're saving so, this foundation is saving so many families. So I guess I just wanna say it is possible that some of this could have could have been avoided if, if isolation was taken seriously as an actual crime and as an abuse, and especially by the DA in, ca in Los Angeles here. I hate to say it, if she would have taken it seriously, she would have had a case that could have really highlighted elder abuse in this country, and she would have had a huge victory on her hands and could have really made a case out of, out of our dad. 
hopefully with our civil case, that is exactly what will happen and it'll shed more light on this. So thank you. Thank you all for coming. And honestly, thank you so much for listening to everybody here. We really appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you. So in closing, I, I, I just want to say that a couple things. Uh, if you come across somebody in a nursing home or someone in a hospital, there is the resident's bill of rights. And if you can write this down, this will help people, especially adult children or loved ones, get in to see their mom or their dad or any loved one for that matter or friend. It's called the resident's bill of rights. People don't know about it. Most nursing homes and hospitals have no idea it exists. Uh, California uh, Association for Nursing Home Reform, Pat McGinnis, who spoke at our conf conference last year, she was one of the um, uh, writers of the bill. Uh, she, you know, this is how I got to see my dad. When TMZ told me he's at a nursing home, I interviewed a woman named Martha Patterson, elder law mom, and uh, she said, you know you can see your dad said, what are you talking, this is literally after I interviewed her, we're on air, and, she, and I'm thinking this woman is, really didn't follow the story too well. She doesn't realize, I've <laughs> been trying to see my dad for eight months now. <laughs> and she said, no, you can see him. I said, how, how can we see my dad, Martha? And she said, because of the resident's bill of rights, your dad is in a nursing home, because we found that out from TMZ. And your dad also said he wanted to see you. I know because I was sitting in court when Judge Leslie Green said Casey Kasem wants to see his kids. So all you need is that, and I, I'll get the court transcripts, and I'll get the bill, and I'll meet you down on Monday at the nursing home. I, okay, let's do it. Walked in there in 30 minutes because of that law, I got to sit with my father. And you can give that to children or um, family members or friends of someone being isolated. Just tell them to look up the Residence Bill of Rights. So they can also go to caseandcares.org, and it's, there's a button right there on the first page that says being denied visitation. Click on that, and it shows the section that you take into a nursing home or a hospital. It does not count if they're in, a, in an assisted living, and it does not count if they're in a residential home, and that's why Case and Cares is working on bills uh, federally and state by state to uh, give adult children more access to their ailing parents. Um, so uh, in closing, please visit our booth. Please take, you know, I know this conference goes on for four days. We have tomorrow, we have one track. And if you can take, you know, maybe one hour of your day and come over and listen to our wonderful speakers, uh, that would be much appreciated because we know that you guys are on the front lines and you see this. And if maybe you're not exactly on there, you can pass this information along. Also, uh, for those of you who want to see a documentary that was done on my father's case, please let me know. Actually, Lisa Caprelli, will you wave your hand in the back there? She's in a white dress. Give her your email and I will send you the documentary done by the Reels channel. They did an amazing job but there is so much left out. There is, it, it is a great, I mean, they did a good job, but now in the last year we have found out so much more that happened in my father's house and what happened to him. Once again, I wanna thank Aaron Martinelli. I wanna thank all of you, the CDAA, for having us. This is such an honor, and I hope to see you tomorrow. Thank you so much.